Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith, um, University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology and also uh, Carleton University Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. So I'm talking about the effects of aerosols on um, climate. Um, most uh, people, uh, you know, the emphasis is always on the effect of greenhouse gases on the climate, but the aerosol particles have a very important effect. It's very difficult to model them. And it's, they have, in fact, they have multiple effects. They have direct effects on reducing sunlight reaching the surface. They have effects on increasing the nature and uh, type and uh, lifetime of clouds, which also affects uh, global temperatures. So I'm trying to break down these factors um, into uh, and trying to explain sort of as part of the story of this. I say part because it's a very complex story. So if the, the nature of the aerosols is very important. Um, so lots of aerosols, if they're just blocking sunlight uh, reaching the surface, they're causing global dimming or cooling of the surface. But if a lot of the aerosols are black carbon particles, then they're absorbing the sunlight. They're not reflecting it back into space. It's totally different from sulfur dioxide aerosols. So black carbon aerosols are absorbing that sunlight in the, in the soot, and that's heating the atmosphere, and then that heat radiates down to the surface. So the net effect of the black carbon, if, it's, if the aerosols are mostly black carbon, then that will actually cause... Uh, cause a global warming. It won't cause dimming and cooling. Okay, so, so um, there was, so let's talk a little bit about some of the um, black carbon. So this is a aerosol optical depth um, data that's taken for example, for some of the very polluted areas of the planet. So, um, so what you can see is the measurements are point measurements and the circles indicate so if the optical depth is red, indicated red, then the atmosphere is very thick of particles and it blocks sunlight reaching the surface. So look at, look at these numbers here. Um, and uh, if, the, if, if, if it's low, then there's more sunlight uh, reaching down. So this is very variable across the surface of the Earth. Um, it's mostly a terrestrial issue. Um, and then you have transport of these particles elsewhere. Um, but it's a much higher effect in the regions where, uh, near the source regions of these particles. So um, there was a lot of work on this. Um, there was a lot of modeling done during the Cold War on the idea of a nuclear exchange and how it would, it, it would bring all kinds of particles, aerosols up into the atmosphere, block the sunlight, cause a nuclear winter after a major nuclear war. So a, a key component of smoke is this black carbon. It's the strongest absorber of visible solar radiation. So it became a central issue in climate change research when we get satellite data, um, in situ ground observations, uh, concluding that the global solar absorption, direct radiative forcing by atmospheric black carbon is as much as 0.9 watts per square meter second only to the CO2 uh, direct radiative forcing. Okay, so it will cause tremendous amounts of warming um, because it's the light's being absorbed by the particles that are in the atmosphere. It's not being reflected back up to space. It's an important component of air pollution uh, plaguing large parts of the world. Uh, incomplete combustion of fossil fuel produces it. Um, household burning of coal uh, briquettes, wood, and dung as fuel for home heating and cooking practiced by three billion people, as well as from agricultural and natural vegetation fires, right? And we're getting a lot more of these fires occurring, especially in boreal forests, also in rainforests, also in the tundra in the far north. So not only does it re release the CO2 from combustion or methane, uh, but it also releases the black carbon particles which um, have a huge radiative forcing, second only to CO2. Okay, so um, this, there's also an estimated worldwide 
uh, 7 million premature deaths annually, most being in East and South Asia. Um, there's also large-scale environmental effects. The so black carbon eventually settles on the ice um, in the Himalayas and other glaciers, gets up to the Arctic and Antarctic, and it lowers the albedo of the ice, making it absorb more solar radiation, causing the heating. So not only, uh, it also does the global dimming at the surface, which can cause drought at the surface uh, if it affects, as it affects rainfall, reduces evaporation, less water vapor in the atmosphere. Um, and it also uh, can affect crop growth with less sunlight. Okay, so it's an established, it's been established that black carbon is huge climate forcer. Um, but it's, uh, there's, a lar there, there's, a, there's a poorly constrained range of the effect but it looks like it's heading up to be one of the largest, you know, on the larger part of the range, like 0.9 it's set up here. So it's a big challenge. So how do we get rid of it? Um, well, let's talk about, uh, you know, it talks about the average here uh, being 0.4 to 0.5, but recent data showing it to be higher, 0.7 to 0.9 and so on. Um, so one of the things is, you know, the ch retooling the transportation industry to having clean cars, electric cars, will get rid of a lot of the black carbon from the incomplete combustion. You know, pollution controls on cars, especially the California stuff, cleaned up the air over there. But on a global basis, um, it's a lot worse. So let's have a look at the, the time evolution of black carbon. So when this stuff is emitted, it's somewhat, it can be somewhat like this, like a very sharp looking, you know, pointy fractal object, no coating on the surface. Um, eventually, um, over time, okay, then it uh, collapses. Um, you, get, you get a rounding of the edges and a collapse. Um, and then um, after, over more time, it gets a coating of various like it can have water on it, it can have sulfates on it, it can have nitrates all adhering to the black carbon. So this is near the source. You would get uh, from incomplete combustion, you get fresh emissions of the black carbon, and then it starts to be transported. And uh, then in, in, as it makes it through different regions, like South or East Asia scale, then it's like this is coated material. So after long weight range, uh, transport so local to, to uh, you know very local point source to cities to regions and so on and this is the um, the climate effect so the DRF remember the DRF is the where are we here where did we define it it's the direct radiative forcing effect okay the DRF so about 0.4 watts per square meter you know, in this particular state, but then over time, as it moves and is transported and is coated, it's closer to one watts per square meter. So this is part of the reason why the range is so wide, if you measure it here versus if you measure it here. So um, the effect is very strong, second only to CO2. Okay, so, um, so there's other, other details in here about the aging and how it ages and the, you know, I don't need to talk about all of these details um, in particular, but there's just that there are various stages of, so black carbon uh, depends on how close you are to the source as to the nature of it and the effect of the, um, the effect of the uh, direct radiative forcing, and you also need to take into account the effect of the of the dimming part. But the radiative forcing seems to far exceed um, any dimming factor, um, and I don't think I need to. Uh, basically, so basically, you know, it's always good when you're looking at a paper. You know, read the intro. You know, look at the diagrams. Uh, you know, read the conclusions, and uh, you get the gist of the paper. So. Um, so basically, the, uh, there has been an emphasis uh, worldwide to start addressing this uh, black carbon aerosol climate effect. Um, so for example, three billion of the poorest people that rely on cooking with solid fuels 
Um, they can't really afford cleaner cooking technologies. Um, so th these findings and uh, suggest, you know, work on um, the materials that adhere to the um, black carbon um, give a global warming potential over 40 years of 2000 for black carbon and the co-emitted organic carbons. Okay, um, so this is a phenomenal number, a global warming potential of 2,000 over 40 years for black carbon. It's a huge number. Um, so reducing, uh, so part of that large rise in temperature uh, seems to be due to uh, the black carbon component of aerosols. So that those aerosols are not causing global dimming. Um, those aerosols are causing uh, they're, they're, they're reducing sunlight at the surface, but they're causing global dimming from black carbon actually leads to global warming, uh, which is not a point that a lot of people are aware of. So the type of aerosols are very important. If they're sulfur aerosols, they'll reflect the incoming sunlight, short wave, back into space. There's less short wave reaching the ground, you get global dimming, and you also get uh, a cooling effect, which, which uh, the, the planet doesn't cool, it did from the 40s to the pre-80s, but then global, the greenhouse gas effect swamped out the aerosol effect, and we've got large warming, but also that um, global dimming effect is, was reduced by the reduction of sulfur dioxide in the aerosol pollutants. Now we have more fires. We still have the incomplete combustion. We have, uh, you know, all these cooking fires and things that, you know, of dung and coal and things in, in, you know, Asia, the three billion of the poorest people. So the black carbon levels are extremely high. So black carbon in the atmosphere, these particles, uh, they cause global dimming at the surface, but they greatly accelerate global warming because the energy is not reflected back to space from the shortwave radiation. It's absorbed in the black carbon, heating up the atmosphere. The atmosphere is heating up and that heat is transferred in all directions, including to the surface where it causes the warming. Okay, so the, con the picture is quite a bit um, more complicated. Um, and I'm going to just remind you, um, actually, no, this is okay. So I can remind you that the warming from the 80s to 2010, 0.6 degrees Celsius, um, and based on the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change radiative forcing numbers for aerosols, there's a, there's a wide range anywhere from minus 0.77 watts per square meter to 0.23 watts per square meter. So global dimming of about 0.45 degrees uh, up to global warming of uh, 0 0.15 degrees. So there's a wide range of factors there, you know, none of which approach uh, numbers that you may hear of, you know, if we stopped all industry, temperature would jump four degrees because of global dimming. That's completely ridiculous, fabricated, non-scientific number. Uh, the number 0 0.45 or 0.5 could be closer to the reality, but again, the, the picture is a lot more complicated because there's a direct and indirect effects, but there's also the type of aerosols are very important. Sulfur dioxide will cause the global dimming and, and cause some cooling when you add it, you know, so it'll, it'll reduce the warming from, from, from the greenhouse gas effect. But if it's a black carbon, if that's dominating the aerosol pollutant, then it will cause global dimming, yes, but it will also cause great global warming because that heat because the atmosphere is being heated. That energy is being absorbed by the black carbon particles. It's not being reflected out to space. So I hope this, um, I hope this helps. Uh, please, uh, you know, support my work um, at my website, paulbeckwith.net, um, with a donation if you're able to. And my next video, I'm going to get into the uh, intricacies of um, solar radiation management with uh, sulfur dioxide um, in the in the upper atmosphere. Thank you.